Good morning. I'm keeping everybody on their toes this morning. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements before we begin in worship this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome you all here to worship. If there are any visitors, uh, any guests that are here with us, we especially want to welcome you this morning and are so glad that everyone is here to worship God together in this place. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, we have our church family picnic. It's an annual event every year. It's going to be over in the National Park and Bartlett Park. Um, be there a little bit before 4. Uh, come and bring uh, chairs, uh, some games. I think some people have already been contacted about bringing things like cornhole and, and Allison's got some other games uh, prepared. Um, but bring whatever you need to sit out in the park for a couple hours. We're going to have plenty of food and we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship. Um, this Tuesday, the Venture Circle is meeting at Ford's Woods and uh, you all are supposed to bring a dish with you to Ford's Woods, uh, and you're going to share that with each other. Um, you'll notice on the back of our bulletin uh, the, our five new deacons for the upcoming three years. Uh, be aware of those. Those are new deacons, but they're old deacons because they've been deacons before. Uh, and we're so glad to have those who have agreed to serve. A youth encounters for grades 7 to 12. It's going to begin Sunday, September the 11th at Allison's home, and that'll be from 6 to 7.30. And uh, Allison needs uh, homes to hold youth encounters in for the fall. If you are interested in hosting the youth at your home on Sunday evening, or if you wonder what that entails, ask Allison or let her know. Uh, you don't have to have a child in the youth group to host them at your home. Uh, last announcement I want to make is we have a staff anniversary uh, on this Tuesday. Uh, August the 30th is the second, uh, the second year anniversary of Allison's ministry here alongside us at First Baptist. And Allison, we are so thankful for all the gifts that you have brought to us over these last few years. And we look forward to the years ahead as you continue to serve faithfully uh, our fellowship here in Middlesbrough. Uh, let's stand and greet each other as we prepare to worship God. Join us in our hymn of praise this morning, hymn number 344, Glorious is Thy Name. Please stand.
us pray together. Most holy, most gracious God, you who is due all glory and honor, may these words that have just touched our lips of your glory, of the ways that we are to acknowledge you in all of your splendor and majesty. May these words not just be about the past for us, but may they be about our future with you that we could stand here now and proclaim with our lips, with our hearts, with our minds, with our full bodies, glorious is thy name, O Lord, because of what you are doing, because of what you will do in us and through us in this place. May it be so as we worship together this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Join me now in our responsive reading, number 279, The Lord is Our God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is, is our God, God. the Lord, the Lord alone. alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and with, with all your soul. soul and with all your mind. Keep these words that I am commanding to you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when, when you, you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. At this time, all of our children are invited to the front for children's time. Good morning. Well, I brought some food with me this morning. Is anybody a little hungry? Does anybody want a snack? I'm a little hungry. Let's see what I got. I've got some flour. Would anybody like any flour? No? Okay. Um, let's see. Baking powder, baking soda. No? None of that either? Okay. Let's see. Salt. We might like some salt? No? Okay. Well, none of that stuff. Okay, are you thirsty? Would you like some oil? I got just a little bit of oil left. Okay, wait a minute. Nobody seems interested in the food that I brought this morning. You know, these, all of these ingredients are good, but not necessarily by themselves. So, you know, the flowers maybe taste a little bland. It might be a little disgusting to eat some baking powder or baking soda by itself. It'd be pretty gross to take a big swig of the oil. So these really aren't things that we want to eat by themselves. But you know what happens when a cook blends all of these things together? Makes a yummy cake or a delicious cookie. And so we have a dessert like this that's so yummy and wonderful. We, bit, we put all these things together, we can make something wonderful. You know, and people are like that. When we all work together, we can make something wonderful. We can make something wonderful for our church, for our community. We are all important ingredients. We put all of us together, all of, all of you, all of our parents, our grandparents, our leaders, our teachers, our deacons, our church staff, everybody working together, we can make something really wonderful. Um, I have a cookie that I want you to take with you, and after you've had a delicious lunch, you may enjoy your cookie, and I hope it will remind you that when we work together, we can make something wonderful. So everybody take a cookie to enjoy later. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for the reminder that we're all important ingredients and help us to remember to work together because when we work together, we make something wonderful. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our hymn of response is number 297, Here I Am to Worship. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 26. Listen now for a word from the Lord from Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me, and test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty, those in, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great congregation. I will bless the Lord. May God add blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these words this morning. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, living and eternal guide with us along the road. 
how grateful we are for the many ways that you walk with us and strengthen our steps, helping us to choose good directions. We walk in faithfulness to you, O oh God. Even as we travel with you, we know that we are not perfect. At times we claim to be, and other times we struggle, struggle under the realization and disappointment that we are not perfect. You are the one whose intentions and motivations and actions are pure and honorable and upright. You are the one who continually and unwaveringly walks in integrity. And we look to you, O oh God, for the way to live fully and faithfully in our world, to live in pursuit of wholeness rather than perfection, and to live with open hearts and open hands and open minds to the ways that you are moving among us. We walk in faithfulness to you, O oh God. Even as we travel with you, we confess we don't always put you first. We know that putting you first is the good thing to do, and it's often what we intend to do. But our humanness gets the best of us. We get caught up in trying to please everyone else, our teachers, our boss, our families, even people we don't know whose opinions shouldn't even matter to us, and yet somehow they do. And sometimes, instead of seeking to please others, we go to the opposite extreme and focus only on what we want. Society tells us to look out for number one. And so we find ourselves on the ever-narrowing pursuit to place our own needs at the center of the universe. Free us from our self-centeredness, O oh God that we might see a greater picture of mission and ministry, of work and worship. We walk in faithfulness to you, O oh God. Even as we travel with you along the roads of our lives, our trust does waver. Our hands aren't always so innocent. And so we find ourselves on uneven landscape, desiring to be back on level footing today. Help us to walk with integrity to make our lives full of truth living. Redeem us as we walk, O oh God, even as we stumble, even as we crawl, even as we wander. We walk and stumble and crawl and wander in faithfulness to you. And as we pray for ourselves this morning, we also lift up to you the many connections we have inside and outside this community of faith. We lift up our families, our friends, our coworkers, our acquaintances, all of our human family, and we know that as we pray for these, you strengthen us. You make us more open and you make us more aware. You help us to see even as you tend to the needs of those that we pray for. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these, our prayers this morning. For those who are separated from family because of duty and deployment, we ask for your protection and peace. For those without a place to call home, we ask for your hope and strength to shelter them. For those experiencing the grief of loss, we ask for your peace and comfort to soothe their spirits. For those processing tough news from doctors, we ask your strength, your hope, and your healing as they continue to endure. For those tormented by depression and addiction, we ask for your love, your healing, your wholeness to be present in and around them. For those feeling unloved due to difference in race, religion, and sexuality, we ask for your love to surround them and undergird their lives. For those already impacted by disasters of hurricane and earthquake, we ask for your presence as workers restore power and as the cleaning and rebuilding begins. For those still in the path of natural disaster today, we ask for your peace as wind and flood threaten New England and the Northeast Coast. God, in these things, we pray for our human family. And as you answer these prayers, use us. 
Use us to be the answers to the prayers we pray. Use us in these altars of our world. May we offer your peace. May we be your comfort. May we speak your wisdom. May we offer your provision. May we be your love. May we live into your hope. May we walk in faithfulness to you. We remember your love and grace and mercy for each one of us, even now as we remember the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Church is One Foundation, hymn number 246. Please stand and sing. Cheers. 
Please bow your heads. Lord, maker of heaven and earth, giver of all things, beautiful all things uh, that are good, bring us to our senses so that, me be, that we may be aware of those things around us that are, that are lasting, those things that are important, those things that are true, that we may take part in your kingdom by giving of ourselves, by giving of our time and our talent and our earthly goods, Lord. We ask this in the holy name. Amen.
As we've been making our way through the book of Acts, for much of it we have heard about what the early church is beginning to look like, the shape that it is is beginning to take, and and there's a particular bent to that shape. Um, We've heard multiple times through the first few chapters of the book of Acts about about what the early church, what the people who are part of the ecclesia are supposed to. To do that, when you become a part of the early church, people gave up their possessions. They gave them all to the community so that everybody could have everything that they needed within the life of the community. And and that early Christian community took those resources and cared for all of those in need within the larger community. A huge part of the early church's ministry was caring for the needs of the least of these. In the community. And this morning, our scripture is a sideways look at the relationships that formed between one of those faithful early church members, a disciple named Tabitha, and those she helped. Let's look at Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse 36. Now, in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At the time, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with a request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. And Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed, and he turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. And then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and he helped her up. And then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. And this became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now we're told in the very beginning of this passage that that Tabitha was devoted to good works and to charity, which is something that every single major religion adheres to, especially the three Abrahamic traditions. Good works and charity are important. We know that Tabitha was a follower of Jesus. She was a disciple and she was faithful in her work as a disciple. And Tabitha dies, and in keeping with the custom of that day, those who are in community with her prepare her body and lay her in a room in the house because there weren't funeral homes in those days. You did the grieving, the mourning in your home. That's why she's there in the home. And the other disciples who were there, they they get word that Peter is close by. And we know from from reading through Acts and from our understanding of the Gospels that that Peter is is an important figure in the life of the early church. And so they send for him and they say, come quickly without delay. Don't wait. Come quickly. Is this sounding familiar? Right? Someone has died. There's a servant of God nearby. Come quickly. Lazarus? Anyone? Anyone? What about the synagogue leader's daughter, right? We've heard this story before, haven't we? In Mark chapter 5, we we hear that story about the synagogue leader's daughter. And listen to who is a part of what happened there. 
beginning with verse 35 of the fifth chapter of Mark. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. See, the synagogue leader had already gone to Jesus to say, my daughter is very ill. Can you come quickly to heal her? And Jesus doesn't come quickly, and somebody comes back and says, it's too late. She's already dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Peter has been there before. And there, when they finally got into the room, Jesus takes this little girl by the hand and says, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. Peter has been there before. I wonder if Peter's mind went back to that time with Jesus when he gets this word, Peter, come quickly, do not delay, and that's why he gets up. We know that he gets right up from where he was and he goes directly to Tabitha's house. When Peter shows up at the house, who's there? We're told that all the widows stood beside Peter in the house. I don't know if that's all the widows in the community or all the widows that had affinity for Tabitha or all the widows that she had helped. But we are told all the widows were there with Peter in the house. And they're weeping and they're showing the clothes and tunics that Tabitha had made them. Now, I think that's a really important detail to this story. I think that's why this story has so much power. Because we know that these widows aren't here because Tabitha ran a clothes closet and she handed them some choice pieces when they came through one day. Tabitha made clothes for these women, but it's more than that, isn't it? We know it's more than just the clothes. Because if we're talking about tunics, and we are these outer garments, that's part of what we're told she had made for them. We know that outer garments in that day weren't just pieces of clothing. They also represented financial leverage. You could borrow against your tunic. If you had your outer garment, if you had your tunic, you weren't left for nothing, right? You could borrow against that. So these women, these widows who had lost their husbands who were living in this male-dominated society, who, who not only lost their companion, but don't have any way into the business world of that day and time. They lost their financial foothold in society when they lost their husbands. It's more than a piece of clothing, isn't it? It might sound like overstatement, but, but what I see that Tabitha has done for these widows is she gave them a place back into society by, by knitting and giving these widows these garments. It's not just clothes. She's given them a place back into society, back into the place of commerce. She's given them social standing. She's given them a new place. That's why they're all standing there waving these garments as Peter comes into the house. Look at what she has done for me. Look at what she has done for us. Can't you do something for her? Can't you give her a new place just like she gave us a new place? We know the rest of the story, right? Peter trusted in what he had seen Jesus do. And, and he said to that, to that disciple, to Tabitha, just like Jesus had said to that 12-year-old girl, Tabitha, get up. And she does. Why is this story important for us today? What's about Relationships. It's first and foremost about relationships. Everyone who is in this sanctuary right now, everyone who is watching over the television, everyone who is in any congregation of faith right now is there because of someone. You're there because of a person. 
Relationships are what get us here, what keep us here. Relationships are what invite us into the different areas of service in the life and ministry of the church. It's also our our relationship with Jesus Christ that calls us out into the world to minister to those in need. Long after any programs of any church are gone, there will still be relationships. Relationships are how congregations begin, and it's relationships that hold us together until the very end of our lives. Just think about for a minute the funerals that you have attended in your lifetime. Why were you there? Because of your relationships with those people. Because they were family, because they were friends, because they were co-workers, because they were a fellow teacher, because they were a neighbor. All of those are relationships. All of those words signify relationships. Every time I have officiated at a funeral, I learn new things about the breadth and depth of people's relationships. I learned the people in the community that I've never met before who were connected to this person and why. That this was the person who helped them get their first job. That this was the person who was my teacher in grade school and helped me get through school when my parents were going through a difficult time. That that this person was there for me when times were hard. But it's all about relationships. If we wonder about the people in our congregation and in the lives of all of our churches in our communities who aren't showing up, the people who are out there not in church somewhere on Sunday morning, and we wonder why not, the place to begin is with a relationship, a one-on-one relationship. That's the place to begin. But the scripture is also about finding place. Tabitha helped these widows find a new place in society. She didn't bring their husbands back to life. And she herself didn't replace them in her own life. What she did give them was hope for the future. Now, I don't exactly know that. Right? In this scripture, we don't have anyone who stepped in and interviewed the widows and, and, and said answered the question, what did Tabitha do for you? But I think Tabitha must have impacted these widows deeply for them to stand there with these tunics, with these garments, and mourn there next to that body. She had to have meant something in their lives. And more than anything, don't we all need hope in our life? I think I've told this story before, but I remember specifically a newscast following Hurricane Katrina. And and the the newscaster was asking the reporter there on the ground at the Superdome, uh, what do you need there right now? And, And the reporter there on the ground with people yelling and screaming behind him says, well, you know, we could use food. We could use a way out of here, water, uh, restroom facilities. We need all of that. But more than anything, we just need some hope. We could use a little hope right now. Now, I think that's what Tabitha gave these widows. Think about the things that you have done out of the relationships that have impacted you. Who has given you hope? Who has given you a place? I was talking with Jim Brown one time about why he does all the things that he does with the House Committee. Jim's been at it for a long time. And and Jim went all the way back uh, to before he was a church member here and talked about Mr. Hatfield. And Mr. Hatfield, along the way, invited Jim to come and be a part of what was happening here in the life of the church. Jim wasn't even a member, but he said, come and help me with some things. And look where Jim is now. We wouldn't know what to do on the House Committee if it wasn't for Jim Brown. Mr. Hatfield gave Jim a place to serve, and when Jim did join the church, it wasn't long until he was heading up the house committee. There are people in each of our lives who gave us a place. 
I ask Allison to tell me about someone in, in her life who gave her a place. And she told me about her act teens leader when she was in church. Lori was her name. And Lori was a music teacher in the schools. And Allison says, at, at times... We were loud, unruly, and unfocused, but she was patient and loving and caring. She met us where we were in our crazy teenage world. She took interest in what we loved. She talked with us about our struggles. She listened to our rambling. She encouraged our dreams. She helped speak truth into our lives by naming the ways that she saw God at work in our lives. And as a teenager, I used to sit with Lori and ask her, what am I going to do with my life? She would speak about the gifts that she saw in me. And she would listen to all my crazy ideas. And she never tired from listening and encouraging. And I know she didn't have to be there, but she was. And Allison says she was the first one that I went to to tell her I decided to go to seminary. And she already knew. She already knew that that's where Allison's path was taking her. The scripture is also about finding place, but it's also about new life. If we understand our bodies as a dwelling place for God, might it be that it's in our lives where we find the best place to display what Christ has done for us and so to call others back into new life? I was talking with Barbara a few weeks ago over at her house and and we were talking about how she's been managing these weeks and months out of her home, displaced and grieving the loss of her home and also grieving the loss of her husband. And, and you all know grief is hard enough when everything else in your life is stable. But when everything is unsettled, grief, the difficulty of, of moving through that grief is, is even compounded even more. And what I was noticing as we were talking, as I was thinking through her story and our story with hers, is that in her life, people keep showing up. They keep showing up and they come in waving tunics and clothes that have been made for them somewhere along the way in some other place. Church members of ours, church members from communities up around Lexington, friends from the neighborhood, people from all over the place keep coming in next to Barbara and showing the tunics that someone else has made for them. And the other day as we were talking and I was asking her how things were going, she says, I just can't tell you how much this has meant to me. I know I'm not back in my house. I know we've got a long way to go but I can't tell you what this has meant to me. You all have given me hope. She said, and I want to know one thing. When you all are done with me in my house, when, you get, when we get back, when I get back in my house, are you all going to go and help anyone else? And I said, yeah. We are in this for the long haul. And she said, well, Okay. Well, when you start helping the next person, I want to know about it because I want to be there to work with you all because of what you have done for me in my life. I want to help wherever you are next. It was hard for me to hold back the tears Because in that moment, somewhere deep inside, I heard these words, Matt, get up, get up. There is new life all around you. May each of us hear these words in our lives, get up. May we respond through our relationships and may others through our work, through our ministry, through our presence, through our just being there, may they find new life in Christ. May it be so for all of us as we serve together in this place. Amen and amen.
Our hymn of opportunity is number 494. Take my life and lead me, Lord. If there is any decision that you would make as we stand and sing together, will you come? Let's stand and sing together. so glad to see each and every one of you here in worship today to be with you this this morning and I look forward to our time together this afternoon at Bartlett Park as we knit ourselves together even closer as we practice being community with each other as we fellowship together I hope you will be there this afternoon for a wonderful time together as we go forth from this place My prayer for each and every one of you is that in those places where you feel dead, in those places where you feel weak, in those places where you feel scattered and lost, that God will come to you and speak words of aliveness to your very being, that you will be stirred up from your places of rest, from your places of pain and loss, And that you will make your way out beyond yourself to speak those same words to those who so desperately need to hear. Go and be the aliveness of Christ in our community this week. Amen and amen.